our second program. We're very excited about that. It's associated with the Museum of Education exhibit within the College of Education. And the exhibit's on the history of college football. And um, this is actually the first session we've had with a guest expert speaker, Matt Brown, who I'll introduce in just a minute. Uh, just a little bit more about the exhibit. It came about through the, through the development of an edited book uh, created by Dr. Christian Anderson, associate professor in the College of Education, and myself, um, affiliate faculty in the College of Education and administrator here at the University of South Carolina. Uh, Dr. Anderson and I were able to combine our research interests, his, his in history and mine in college athletics to see this edited book come to fruition. The book is titled, The History of American College Football, Institutional Policy, Culture and Reform, and it was published earlier this year. The book includes 10 distinct chapters by 10 different authors and covers a variety of historical topics, including athletics conference realignment, emergence of TV and media, traveling trophies, and social justice perspectives, all woven together under the theme of college football. Be sure to check out a little bit more about the um, exhibit. I'm gonna drop this in the chat in case anyone would like to learn more when you are able to come to Wardlaw College. We'd love that. And just also uh, beyond today's session, which will last until about four o'clock or so, there will be a follow-up session starting at 4.30 intended for undergraduate and graduate students, a chance for our students here to really engage with author Matt Brown. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop that Zoom link because it is separate in the chat as well. And I'll post that later as well. Uh, but just wanna put that on your radar. So before we get started, we just want to give a few thank yous and shout outs. Uh, so first of all, thank you to the Museum of Education in the College of Education for supporting the exhibit in today's talk. A special shout out goes to Dr. Toby Jenkins, Museum of Education Director and faculty member in the College of Education. The Museum of Education is partnering with the Center for Innovation and Inclusion in Higher Education, CIHE, here at, the, at USC to sponsor today's program and we appreciate their support as well. Thank you to our author, Matt Brown, for making the time to join us today in his very busy schedule and for focusing on topics in college sport that spur curiosity, debate, and influence over today's game. And lastly, thank you to attendees for joining us. We really appreciate your participation and engagement today and for your overall interest in college sport and the history of college football. So let's get started. I have a short intro about Matt. He's the publisher of Extra Points a newsletter covering business, educational, and administrative stories in college athletics. Extra Points just sold, and I mean just hot off the press, to D1 Ticker earlier this month. Prior to launching his own business, he was a college sports editor at SB Nation, or Sports Blog Nation, for several years running their team site coverage. He is the author of What If? A Closer Look at College Football's Great Question. He lives in Chicago with his wife, two little girls, and a dog. We should also mention that we landed Matt, Matt during this very busy season because of this new partnership with D1 Ticker. This is a very well-established organization focused on college sport and the many significant developments that occur daily, sometimes hourly. And so congratulations again on this opportunity. So Matt, we'll hand it over to you to take it away. Thank you so much. It is a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for uh, allowing me to participate. I've, I've grown to really uh, appreciate the opportunities that I've had since launching Extra Points to be able to work with the University of South Carolina. I've had a chance to, to share some journal articles with CSRI and, had, and, and some of my publications have been used in, in undergraduate coursework here before. And I've, I've uh, more so I think than, than many of the other universities that I work with. So yeah, having the chance to be able to come here in a different capacity um, is is a wonderful a wonderful opportunity which I really appreciate. Um, I am I'm happy to tell, talk a little bit about the the book that I had written a couple of years ago, which I think uh, interplays nicely with the the text here that the Dr. Anderson has edited. And I'm happy to talk a, a little bit about a couple of those chapters. And what I, I try to do when I'm asked to to come in and speak is to make sure that, that time is as impactful for the audience themselves and not just me talking about the things that I'm interested in. And so I want to make sure I leave plenty of opportunity. Uh, for questions and, and to be able to steer this in a way that, that's most impactful uh, and useful for you. One of the reasons that I am so fascinated still in this sport um, isn't just because I like college football. I, I, admittedly, I do. I, I grew up 
not far from Columbus, Ohio, which is one of the most football mad places uh, in, in the country. And it, it, it had a, a different meaning for me for me growing up because uh, even though I have my last name is Brown, uh, my, my whole mother's side of my family immigrated to this country from Brazil. And, and football was one of the ways that they uh, we, we we kind of felt they, they became more Americanized. My mom, you know, we, we, the, our family lore is that she learned English in part through Cleveland Browns broadcasts, which I would imagine in the 70s would have been a great way to learn profanity before maybe learning other other more useful useful things. And and that was passed down. And it's not really a big surprise that none of us are Browns fans at this point. Um, but I'm also interested in it because I feel like college football is, is, a, is a great way to be able to jump off and tell stories and learn about this country and its relationship with higher education and its relationship with religion, which is certainly interwoven all throughout college athletics history, its relationship with race and power and um, the, you know, provincial cultures and, and, and micro uh, areas and, and demographics. You know, this, this is a rarity in American sports where some of the most important, powerful programs are not always in New York or Los Angeles or Chicago or major population centers. I feel like to, to really love the sport and to, and to get in the weeds and, and dig into it requires you to, to learn and, and have an appreciation and, and know about the rural South and the rural Midwest and places that aren't necessarily as part of the professional sports story in exactly the same way. Um, I, I, I'd be more than happy to, to talk about a couple of the chapters. I mean, th th this thinking was part of what drove me to write my own book uh, a couple of years ago, What If? In part because looking at a similar here with, with, with this other text from, from the university, there's, I think, a couple of particularly pivotal moments that shaped not just who is good at college football in the year 2021 or, or what teams have seen success, but how they're organized and how that revenue is distributed and how this whole power structure is distributed. It's... it's um, I, think, I know that this is a sport that gets compared to European and South American soccer a lot. There, there are some similarities in that the kind of friends that your fan, that your institution made back in 1910 does play a pretty significant role in what you're experiencing 100 years later, even uh, rather than just quality, excuse me, or, or money. So, so that is part of why my book focused quite a bit on conference realignment and on conference realignment decisions and pathways that that weren't necessarily followed. I, I think. The two of the chapters that were most interesting for me to write about were uh, one was about the proposed airplane conference, which would have been in the early 1960s as airline travel became more affordable and, and more commonplace. Uh, there was a, this an idea that got pretty far along down the road to why would we need to restrict our conference affiliations just to regional institutions that share geography? Wouldn't we make a whole lot more money if we had USC and UCLA in one corner and Notre Dame and Penn State and Pitt and Navy in another corner? And why don't we just make that a conference and we could play the championship game in the Rose Bowl? And, and this all feels very contemporary. Right, right? This is right out of the off-season sports blogger playbook right now to write about this in May or June. And this was something that that's coming out here in, in 61, 62 and talked about you know, what that would have meant financially how that would have changed how we perceive of Notre Dame and an independent program now, what that would have done for college sports in Southern California, which is uh, maybe not, not in the greatest place now as, as, it's, as it's been historically, but inertia is a pretty powerful force. The, um, it was kind of startling looking through those old newspaper archives and looking, listening to some of these interviews from back then about how contemporary a lot of the financial conversations in college athletics, a lot of those things were. There's, there's this, this reoccurring joke in every newsroom I've been a part of about how there really aren't very many new fights in college football. We're arguing about the same stuff, just the numbers have gotten bigger. We, I mean, I'm, I'm sure most people in this room, I've seen the, the, night, the, the Carnegie report from like 1929, I, I, I think, and those critiques about how this has become a big business and we're making a mockery of, of amateurism and institutions are focusing too much on college sports and not on academics. Well, I mean, all you have to do is go to a Drake group meeting now and you can hear the exact same things. And I'm not saying that those arguments are right or wrong, just that it's the same argument even before the night of Regents v. Oklahoma, even before we had a 16-team SEC, even before we're paying a football coach $5 million. It's all, it's all been part of it. And I think digging into the airplane conference crystallized that for me uh, in a different way. The other failed conference realignment plan that I wrote about that uh, didn't end up happening, that I think would have shaped things a lot and, and kind of falls on that line was the, the idea of the Metro Super Conference, which was discussed 
um, in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, I, I, looking around here at the cameras, I think most people here, if you're fans of college athletics, would, would remember the Metro Conference as a basketball league. I'm, I'm, I'm 34, so this was uh, a little bit before my time, although I'm aware that it, it existed. Um, and this was really, I think, the first league leadership to get together and realize the future in a deregulated post-1980, you know, post-Regents Oklahoma world. We taught this, this texture talks so much about being so transformational. The future is in cable television. And we are going to be able to make so much more money selling our own rights individually as a collective and maximizing our reach by being concentrated in major metropolitan TV markets. It, it would be advantageous for us to, to align with Rutgers, who's terrible um, because of all the TV sets that are in the tri-state area. It's important for us to align with Temple, who is terrible because there's a lot of tele, uh, TV sets in Philadelphia. This is where TV practically started. It, uh, and, and and this you know this was this was Raycom that got involved and they proposed we're going to bring in this the 16 team league we're going to be the first league to go into divisions we're going to we're going to go into we're going to grab Penn State for the Big Ten does we're going to we're going to unify Florida State and Miami and then we're also going to bring in a couple of smaller programs that had been successful like East Carolina or Southern Miss who I think you could argue completely missed the boat on the last couple of lines of realignments and went from being perennial well, at least in the case of ECU around this time period, a, a top 25 team that could beat uh, SEC teams. Southern Miss was very good around this time and continued up through the Larry Fedora era. They missed the chance on getting in, in, in some of this big money. The league came very close to happening. I remember I talked to some former Raycom executives who sent me the briefing books and sent me like, here's, here's what the, uh, the television people were saying our figures were. It, it ended up falling apart just at the end. Um, because of uh, you know Penn State ended up going to the Big Ten and a couple of other institutions backed out at the last chance might have been an idea a little bit ahead of its time, but you can I think draw a pretty straight through line between every argument mentioned then to what's the to, to explaining the rationale for why the SEC expanded and then expanded again and why the Big East was created and then fell apart and why we've seen a lot of the changes in my lifetime. Uh, again, like it, it didn't come out of thin air. It was something that, you know, very beginning had a genesis in the 60s, up through the 80s, and then today. Um, that, I think, was what was ex part of what was exciting to me to read some of these essays. You know, not all of them were about things I knew really well. I, I used to live not that far from Gallaudet, but I didn't really know their history. I didn't really, I, I didn't understand, uh, as somebody who's not a historian, about some of the the pejorative conflict. Uh, in context around individuals that were hearing impaired around that time and this need to kind of embrace the musc this almost muscular Christianity ethos through, through a football program. This was instructive to me, but I could think, again, those are similar arguments that were made at other institutions that were serving um, uh, different populations, even PWI state institutions, right? This, this, is, your, this is your chance to, to, to step back at the North, right? And, and, and win something for South Carolina or, or, or win something for Kentucky if we're able to have Gridiron glory, and you can see how those things are are are, are connected. Um, I, I I'm happy to kind of dig in here a little bit, but if there are if there are questions from anybody about a particular scenario or a particular section from this book that that maybe we could talk through, I I, I would be more than happy to do that. If there's no questions, we can kind of keep going down this freight train. But I'd love to make sure that this time uh, is for you. Yeah, if anyone has any questions for our author, Matt Brown, at this time before we delve in, feel free to um, unmute yourself and, and you're welcome to, to ask directly. Okay. And I'll say now, if you don't have it just yet, we'll come back to you. But um... <laughs> it's, okay, if we don't have one, uh, Christian, I'm, I'm sure there's there's a couple that you and I can go back and forth here a, a, a little bit. but. Um, I don't. Yeah, just charge ahead. I we're looking forward to hearing. Uh, you know, you you said you were, wanted to talk about a, a couple of different chapters, so charge ahead, and then maybe we can see what questions uh, formulate from that. Sure. You know, I, I'll be honest. From reading this, one of the ones that was so interesting to me was was. I'm, I'm sorry. Stop. <laughs> this uh, the the chapter here on on early football at BYU, and the this idea here. The, the, the transformation between this institution rejecting football on uh, religious and, and perhaps cultural grounds to then wanting to assimilate greater into American society and football being a vehicle for that, which I, I think is one of the, the, the biggest themes throughout early college football history. And, and even, again, with my own family, 
that the pathway to being accepted in American, if not elite society, mainstream society comes through in part football success. You see that with, with, with BYU here. I had no idea that they'd reached out to Notre Dame and uh, you know, brought in Newt here for a, a, a summer semester. The idea that he was uh, tied up with paperwork and got stressed about getting his grades in, that was one of the most relatable things I think I've seen from a, from a football coach here in a long time. And, and then eventually becoming a, a successful program. I, uh, I, I, I would, I would love, I mean, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing from you or, or, or learning or hearing more about the external push against embracing football from the beginning, because I, I, I'm a Latter-day Saint myself. I'm not from Utah, which is a different experience if you're LDS living in the Midwest, which I have my whole life, but it, it, it's hard for me to wrap my head around the idea of like my faith community, not being extremely Plug, active in intercollegiate sports or even high school sports there's there's gyms in all of our churches like the, the idea of like being physically active and playing sports and, and that being you know just as much of, of being lds as being a boy scout or about doing these other kind of like totems going through the, the faith community that the idea of that not that not being the case feels so alien to me but clearly this is a very different church before david o mckay uh, you know, kind of came in and shaved the beard and 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 tried to mo tried to modernize everything. This was this was new for me, and I think speaks to kind of the chapter that I ended up doing about really how unlikely it was that this team ever got good at football. There's there's a lot of private religious institutions in this country that have started football teams and that try to compete intercollegiately, and not too many of them that I think are facing greater cultural headwinds to not be good. And then yet they they hire a Hall of Fame coach and the stars kind of aligned for a minute and now now they're in the Big Twelve. Um, I, I, Christian, let me let me when you were editing this, was there for for this chapter? I guess or some of the other ones here where you've had a little bit more specific information. Was there anything that? really blew you away or, or, or a story that you thought that you knew pretty well until you actually got into the archives and realized like, oh my gosh, there's there's seven more layers to the story that I, I didn't realize. Well, when we when we initially came up with the idea for this chapter, for this book, it was a history of college athletics. That was the call for papers, was any, you know, anything related to the history of athletics. And we thought we might get this nice potpourri of, of chapters about uh, college athletics. Maybe we'd get something interesting about college tennis or lacrosse or, you know, some of these stories that don't, that, that, that don't bubble to the, to the, to the surface that much. Well, yeah. we received uh, 25 or 30 submissions and most of them football, uh, second most basketball, of course. And, you know, all the, the, this other expectation didn't, didn't play out. Well, then as we put them out for peer review and started going through them, all of the strongest papers were about football. And, uh, and in fact, um, the only ones that we really were interested in publishing were about football, just because of the strength of, the, of their arguments, of their historical uh, analysis and research. And so we just reframed it as a, as a book about the history of college football. And then we realized that all of the chapters uh, basically take place during the first hundred years of football from 1869 to 1969, with the exception of the 1984 case, uh, which uh, of course has its roots before 1984. I mean, the roots go back to the 1960s and the buildup of, of, of TV and then the 70s and, and so on. Um, and so uh, it, it ended up, you know, really being focused about college football during its first hundred years. And then, of course, Amber's chapter is a conclusion chapter that kind of ties it all together. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there, there were, you know, I have, it, it was also interesting to see the personal connections that were not solicited by any, by any means, uh, but they just kind of came in that way. I have deaf grandparents, and here's an article about football among deaf football players. Uh, I grew up in Utah, and here comes a chapter about BYU. Um, I'm interested in, in the history of student protest, and here comes a chapter about protest at San Jose State. 
which connects with the, you know, with other chapters. So, um, yeah, it, it's interesting how these things come together, not really planned, but uh, they, they just sort of uh, emerge that way. But I, I also didn't, even though I'm, I'm a University of Utah alum, you know, the holy war between Utah and BYU is, you know, uh, one of the great rivalries. I had no idea about that early history of, of BYU football. Um, and so, you know, the, for those who haven't read the chapter, basically, uh, you know, BYU bans football in 1900. And then around 1919, 1920, they decide to bring it back. And they hire, as Matt was mentioning, Newt Rockney to come in and coach their coach. Um, the most and, famous coach in America. Yeah. Right. So, you know, playing with the what if, I mean, there, there's one of your what ifs. What if they had continued to not allow football or if they had waited another decade or two to, to bring football back, you know, what would BYU athletics look like now? And, and you know, the whole intersection with the way that it was the pub, this public facing uh, front porch kind of thing for the for the church is, is really fascinating. I understand it. Yeah, I mean, when I when I was reading, because I, I did a chapter about BYU in my book too, but that was focusing more on the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And my understanding, you know, really prior to, to bringing in Lavelle Edwards, the, their legendary Hall of Fame coach that was a pioneer in air raid uh, offensive concepts, was that even though the school had a football team in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, they were terrible. And it, the school was was mostly perceived to be, to the extent it had an athletic program, was a basketball school. You know, reading some of these contemporary reports in the 50s, like their coaches are still teaching class. Their assistant coaches are essentially glorified GAs, where even by the 1950s, more robust staffs were, were pretty common. And uh, whether that was the University of Utah, whether that was other peers around the around the, Col you know, the Colorado or Arizona or New Mexico area, had had better programs. And it wasn't until really as the Edwards era was starting to kind of get into gear a little bit that the university decided to, that we should make some some infrastructure investments and then and and become a stronger program. Like the 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 key Intermountain West team, like as the sport kind of evolved, was Wyoming. Like that was the kind of the first like you know national power in anything resembling a more modern era as as teams were were more integrating. And then of course. As because there's this all ties together between protests and BYU and everything else, right? Then you have the Black 14, which uh, effectively nukes Wyoming as a national college football entity anymore. This is where uh, the head football coach Lord Lloyd Eaton kicks 14 members, black members off the team, uh, who indicated, you know, we we'd like to wear an armband, we'd like to protest against the fact that at this time the LDS Church did not extend the priesthood or uh, a lot of uh, ecclesiastical or, or cultural benefits to to black families, to to, to, to African Americans, and and uh, so you know, this this is kind of like de facto the last team to, to really integrate. Um, and then when everybody, I mean, in in the short term, Wyoming turned out okay. The players left. Uh, governor and the local stakeholders for Wyoming really supported the football coach, but uh, it became much harder to recruit athletes to that school afterwards. And uh, there's just not enough people in Wyoming to really build much of a football team if you're not recruiting athletes from out of state. And if people perceive your program as being hostile to people that don't look like you or people that, that maybe didn't grow up in Laramie, it's going to be hard to build talent. Wyoming immediately cratered. And we saw, I think, I think some similar examples from programs that I think followed a similar path to, to Coach Eaton around that time period. I know this happened at Oklahoma, at, at Oregon State. Um, uh, there were similar uh, racial protests at Iowa around around this time period. And if you took a really hard line, uh, that may have given you local support, but it, it can be, I mean, we're even seeing this now. This is, this is on, on, a, on a similar scale. I think this is a big reason why, uh, you know, Coach Patterson at TCU is, and ended up leaving that program because the sport is changing and the dynamics and the power structure between coach and player is changing. And just like I think we saw in the late 1960s and early 1970s that the idea of an African-American athlete not, uh, you know, challenging this idea that they don't have agency or that they don't have the ability to express themselves as people and they're requiring a different baseline level of dignity and they have more power in that structure and, 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 want, and want to be treated as such. We see this now with, with changing in NCAA regulations and with the way that money's come into the sport that and, and I think a, a, in a, a post-NIL, post-transfer world, a, a high-level athlete can come into a program and say, 
I want to be able to talk to the media because that means I can grow my social followings and take advantage of name image likeness. I want to be able to play. And if I'm not going to play, I have the ability now to transfer without penalty. I, you know, want, you know, I, I, I need to be treated X, Y, or Z. And if you are hardwired to only being able to coach a certain kind of athlete with a certain kind of power and a certain kind of structure, and you're not able to evolve past that, you're not going to be as successful. Um, and it, it's, it's funny because I would not describe progressive and dynamic as like adjectives to describe BYU. And that's something I, I, I say with, with some degree of love, again, as, as being part of that community. But I did that better with some of their peers, you know, coming out of that decade, certainly on the football field and, and giving people more flexibility and, and being willing to, you know, to embrace athletes that didn't necessarily go on LDS missions or, or do things of the way that other parts of that faith community went. And between that, what they were able to do schematically led to a national championship. Uh, and it led to a, a, lo a lot of success. And we can see some of their peers that didn't do that. And you, it's right, you can go all the way back to that very beginning. There's a couple of decisions that could have gone either way. Things might have looked pretty different. You're right. If they got started 10 years later, I, I think we can see throughout, you know, throughout college football history, there are programs that have benefited even today because they were first to the game. You know, Michigan is capital M Michigan, of what it is in part because of what Michigan was in 1905. Inertia is a super powerful force in, in this sport. And if they got started in 1930 or 1940, it's a lot harder to build that kind of dynasty and to, and to build that kind of infrastructure and those years and years of generational fans. Um, there aren't many examples of Boise States and Central Florida's, um, although a lot of schools spend a lot of money to try, of essentially being expansion teams without all of that history. Uh, I, I, I think I think in this sport it might be a little bit different in basketball or some other sports, but in football, um, you, you really need to have made the right friends and made the right decisions if you wanted a, a big time program way before any of us were born. So you mentioned media uh, in there a few times and, and the media exposure and, and the way that, you know, the Boise States and the Central Florida is part of part of how they were able to develop is because they're able to get on national TV, even if they're in a in a market like, you know, Boise, Idaho. Um, I'm just going to share my screen for one second. This is a one of the panels from our exhibit. And I know that you said this is one of the what ifs that you wanted to talk about is, is the media mm -hmm. aspect, the TV aspect. You know, here's the here's the 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 TV broadcast schedule for all of 1968, all of the whole season, 33 games. And then on the on the other side, you can see one Saturday in 2021, um, how many games that you can watch. So, you know, uh, I know that you wanted to talk about that 1984 decision, maybe explain a little bit about what that was and then and, and how that shaped uh, football and, and, and maybe how it could have uh, gone differently. I would love to. Um, why, why, don't, why don't, before we get to 1984, maybe, maybe we can step a little, a little bit farther back. Um, to I, I, I want to say this would have been the early 19, 1950s, some of the first schools to start signing TV deals, because as, as the technology matured, and it was actually possible to, to broadcast multiple games, in the very beginning, the NCAA didn't control everything. So a school, just like a school that had the ability to sell their own radio rights, since radio became a thing at the very beginning, schools could do this as well. And a, a, a couple of schools, were, were, as I understand it, were pretty early to the game. And uh, like like Northwestern and, and Oklahoma were, were had broadcast some, some of their games, but it wasn't really until two different schools announced their own individual television deals that kind of terrified everybody. One was Notre Dame, which uh, would have made sense because that was the closest thing back then to a, a national. Board. And the other, it was Penn, which is uh, maybe a little bit surprising to a college football fan now. Uh, Penn is not generally not even that good of an Ivy League team, let alone a, a, a national brand or anything. But at this point, and I think Stassen's the president and the Ivy League as we know it as, a, as an athletic entity doesn't exist. The Ivy League schools are playing with each other, but Penn is also trying to play Minnesota and Ohio State and Chicago and some of these big name teams. And they're trying to maybe follow an athletic footprint closer to what you might expect from a Big Ten school, right? You know, academics, and, 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 you know, warrior poets in the classroom, but also champions on the football field. And if that happened to benefit Harold Stassen politically, well, maybe that would have been just a nice little side bonus. So they, they signed these, these six-figure deals, local television deals. And then everybody, other administrators were terrified 
because right in, in the early 1950s, if you're trying to balance your athletic budget, there's no ESPN check. There's no NCAA tournament gigantic check. Gambling isn't it doesn't as big of a revenue driver as, as at least not legal gambling. Right. Well, back, back then. So you, you made you balanced your books through ticket sales. And there was this very big concern that we can't possibly sell tickets to Holy Cross or Lafayette or Ball State football games if people can stay home and watch Notre Dame or God forbid the Penn Quakers. We can't we can't, we can't have it. And 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 this was, you know, not just uniquely college uh football concern. There there are people I believe in, in involved in major league baseball that had similar concerns. And you hear this sometimes with, with with other leagues. And so that led to this idea of we need to have we need we need to what if you can't get rid of television completely. We need to uh, control it and limit, limit it and mitigate it. We'll have the NCAA handle it. So I, I had a chapter in my book about what would have happened if they let Penn keep their TV deal and Penn pursue this idea of like big time uh, college athletics. And I, I think there, based on some of the contemporaries and, and quotes and, and goals from that university administration, it's not impossible to imagine Penn being in the Big Ten instead of Penn State had they decided to go down that road. They had the media infrastructure. They had the football field. They had the geography and a lot of advantages that Penn State, you know, pre-Paterno really, really didn't have. That's that's not the way things went. But that sets the stage here for 84, because then you're right, in the 60s and and in the, in the 70s, they, that, that, well, who was on TV was controlled by the NCAA. And if you looked at that list, those weren't the best games of 1968. I saw a Dartmouth game in there. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're going to show some division, some FCS. I mean, they called it like a university and college division or, or some some smaller schools. Are, and things that people don't actually want to watch because they wanted to get people to go to the games. And what we were realizing then is if you're in Oklahoma or Georgia or Ohio State, well, one, your fans want to watch you. And there is political pressure. The, the, I think this happened a couple of times with like Michigan State Notre Dame games. This is such a big deal. We have to put it on television. So there's 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 pressure from constituents. And then also there, the institutions are realizing we're leaving so much money on the table. And pro, professional football, took a much more aggressive and conciliatory uh, approach towards television and completely lapped college football, right? And in the 1950s, and, 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 you know, not, not too far after that, college football was more, was more popular. That, that, that was, that was a, a, big, a larger entity. And then uh, I think in part because of this television strategy, professional football became uh, much more popular, much more national. It, it looks great on TV. It, it's a game that translates really well to that form. So that's what leads us eventually to Oklahoma and Georgia challenging this idea, saying that like it, it is it is an un, unlawful restraint of trade to uh, to to uh, prohibit us from being able to sell our own television rights and being able to expand in that marketplace. And and that's what the the courts ultimately decided. I, I think if you if that wasn't the case and we still had a a, a salary cap as it were on television revenue, like one. There's not going to be nearly as, as strong of an incentive to make the same conference realignment decisions that basically happened everywhere from 1989 until shoot two days ago. Basically, you know, base, basically there's not a, a huge incentive to, to bring in a Rutgers to do anything. No disrespect to anybody in this room that has a degree from Rutgers or is a fan of Rutgers. I'm, I'm sorry, your, your team's been terrible for the last 150 years. 147 of the last 150 years, you're valuable because you're a great research institution, you're in the AAU, and you're in a major media market and allowed people to kind of uh, institute a BTN tax for having you. That wouldn't have happened if there was no financial benefit for doing it. We can, we can talk. I, I think looking at that, this would be better for consumers and certainly better for higher education if we no longer had $220 million budgets for athletic departments and they were instead $60 million budgets. But um, I think given the way the courts have gone over the last couple of decades, if it didn't happen in 84, I, I think it would require us to really kind of dig into some real alternate history with how the Supreme Court worked to pretend it wouldn't have happened at another time eventually. And because of that decision, um, you ended up, I mean, and, and because of the decision back in the 1950s too, you ended up with a activist NCAA that had the power to act as a real regulatory body because now the, it was the NCAA that could decide if you were on TV or not, and that is an enormous stick to wield. That you know that whereas before you know with the sanity code or or, or even pre sanity code, there wasn't really anything that the centralized authorities could, could really do to you that would scare to anybody that was breaking a rule. It might have been your conference or the local media that that had a larger role in in, in fraction policing. So I, I, it's hard for me honestly to think about like what, what modern college football looks like right now. 
for me to think of any other single more impactful decision than, than, that, than that court case. Just like I think if we look back at football games before integration became really deeply meaningful and, and, and across the country and say like, well, we should take some of that, that, that data with a grain of salt because things have changed so much since then. I would look at, at almost Regents v. Oklahoma as a, a, you know, kind of what happened before then and what happened after then because it so fundamentally changed the financial dynamics of this whole industry. Great, Matt. Uh, thank you for that. We're going to take just a second. Um, really good insights. To see if it, anyone who's in the audience has a question about what's been shared thus far or anything else related to Matt's work, um, the exhibit, or any of the above. So, sure. Um, I'll ask a question. Hi, Matt. Um, no. You, you could probably guess my question was going to be about rivalry um, because, you know, it's one of my favorite topics. But I saw in your book, like you have a chapter on the backyard brawl. And then I saw also in Christian and Amber's book, I think it's chapter eight or nine is about kind of these rivalries or traveling trophies in Division three, um, which I'm looking forward to, to kind of digging into. I haven't read that chapter or, or watched the, the video associated with it, but I'm going to. So my question is. What do you think, you know, with the conference realignments, like we've lost some of the traditional rivalries and um, I'm wondering, you know, if you think that's has a major effect or if, you know, they they can be sort of rebuilt or different rivalries could be rebuilt. Um, so conferences shouldn't worry about that. Um, and if you think it's a trend that's going to continue where, you know, maybe as the realignments trickle down, we'll continue to see realignments where rivalries just don't seem to be taken into consideration very much. That's a really good question. And I think it's hard to speak about that from a really broad level because the circumstances behind a lot of these changes are different league to league and what, what a rivalry means and who those stakeholders are are, are different, right? I, um, excuse me, when I, um, I can think of a couple of pretty significant rivalries that have been interrupted thanks to realignment. And if you were to tell somebody in like the early 70s that Oklahoma and Nebraska weren't going to play annually anymore, it would it would blow your mind. It would be almost like Ohio State and Michigan now play. We, I mean, we just saw the Battle of the Piney Woods, which is a big deal. And like at the FCS Texas level, just got split up like last week. And we haven't, uh, I've, I've talked to the athletic directors involved there. We haven't gotten confirmation that, you know, Sam Houston and, uh, and uh, you know, Stephen F. Austin is still going to keep playing. I mean, now now there's a difference in classifications, uh, which which can make that more challenging. I, that, that's been the case with with Idaho and some of their longstanding rivalries. It is a I, I look at, at, at th these kind of breakups here as being bad for consumers and for being bad for institutions' identity. You know, to, to kind of go back again to to the Holy War. Um, the Holy War is one of the most fascinating rivalries to me, and I think the Egg Bowl in Mississippi is another example because I think that rivalry. Is one of the most interesting things about any of those programs where you have two schools, you know, one you got the, the rich kid school and the less rich kid school. You got the 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 the, the ag school and, and the and the, the school with the for the Bruce's the professional classes. And they're so close together that you can't get away from them. If you're in Mississippi, there's going to be an old Miss grad in your office, in your neighborhood, in your church who's going to bring this up. And this is, I know the Joe, I don't think this is part of your research, but it's anecdotally, I think that I, 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 I track is these most intense rivalries are the ones where the stakes are actually low, where very rarely does the Egg Bowl champion go to the SEC championship game or really do anything on a national level. This is the Super Bowl. Um, Ohio State, Michigan, you know, where, where I grew up, that, that's pretty often for the best team in the Big Ten, and it's decided national champions before, and that's, a, that's an important rivalry. It's not the same thing as Oklahoma, Kansas, which I think has been deeply meaningful on the football field exactly once. In 2007, it was, it was, a, it was a big deal. Um, so it might be easier for administrators to decide, well, if we can make an extra 600 grand or 6 million somewhere, maybe, maybe, maybe we can avoid this. But I, I think that's bad for, from a marketing and branding perspective, it's bad for the fans and it, 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 it's bad for, for other potential stakeholders. It's, if, you're, if that rivalry is an important extension of your own civic and statewide pride, um, if there are lawmakers that are willing to get involved, which in many states, from Ohio to Utah to Texas to Virginia, we've seen governors are happy to get involved. Lawmakers are happy to drag people in there and holler about rivalries and, and make schools play games or, or prohibit them from playing something else. And that, that, that gets tangled up. I think, from my perspective, it's unfortunate because inertia and all of that history is part of what makes this entire enterprise compelling. And ultimately, 
it's what makes it, I think, uh, even financially feasible because you're not selling college football because it's the best played football on the planet. It, it, the NFL is better. The, there, there, there are a lot. When you watch college football on a Saturday, even when you're watching Alabama on that field, there's a couple of dentists who are playing. They're, they're jacked dentists who can squat 600 pounds and are elite athletes, but they're not going to be playing much in the NFL where, you know, the, which the best, the best you're, you're selling this and it's compelling and we research it and we study it and we spend all this time on it because of what it reflects back about ourselves and about our emotional ties. I didn't go to the Green Bay Packers. I went to the Ohio State University. And so that it means something different. And when those changes diminish what, um, what ties everybody together? I think that's to the detriment of the sport itself, the product, and and the school. Couldn't help but share another slide from our exhibit uh, in the background while you're talking about rivalry. Yeah. You know, the, and and you know, I know that this is Utah BYU in that in that uh, cartoon by Pat Bagley from the Salt Lake Tribune. But you can put any two rival, you know, any two rival USC Clemson you know, Michigan, Ohio State in, in those two characters. And it's the same thing, get a life, you know, you, you're, you're, uh, but, you know, uh, this game isn't uh, a matter of life and death. It's more important than that. Exactly right, right? And, and with that example, and I, again, I think back about Joe's research here, like these best ones are, you think you're, you're mad at the other guy you wanted to get a life, but you know what you're really similar. That, that, you, that you have a lot, of, you have enough different where you can still cast the other people as shameless deviants, but, but and, uh, you have enough similarities where you're actually close enough where you, you have those kind of conversations where, where it means something. Um, I, from talking to other administrators now, and, and especially because I, I cover conference realignment, especially at the low and mid-major level quite a bit, I know it's something that people are cognizant of, but it's also, it, 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 you also have to think about how it fits in with your university's larger strategic goal. So if you are, say, a low major private institution that is heavily tuition dependent and you have an opportunity to change your league affiliation in a way that's going to give you more exposure into large urban markets where you think you might be able to recruit a few more students and keep the doors open for the English department. But it means that you're not going to be playing against your crosstown rival, which is in rural Kentucky and has a population of 200 people. Well, that sucks your athletic department, sucks your basketball coaches. I can understand why a university president would still do it. And those are the kind of conversations that are happening now. Yeah, Matt, you bring up a really good point. And I'll just point to another chapter we had in the book about, um, well, you know, we are members of the SEC, proud members, as you can imagine, even if we're not always successful on uh, Saturdays. But, uh, you know, there was the university presidents met in the early 1900s to really talk about um, conference realignment. These are some early beginnings of SEC discussions. And what I think we found really interesting in that chapter is how heavy handed even then university presidents were in, in establishing their kind of allies within the um, reestablishment of the Southeastern Conference. And if those schools only knew today, kind of like, what if, you know, like Tulane, yeah. what if Tulane had stayed at the SEC? Could you even imagine? I mean, they're seem irrelevant now, right? But it's just really interesting that chapter is probably one of our most, um, one of our best examples of how administrative influence really dictated so much of that conference realignment. And to your point, that is playing out today and for the exact reasons we're talking about, to drive institutional prestige and how that conversation will continue to unfold. I think we're really interested to, to see from a higher education perspective. And that's honestly a big part of my business now. And and part of why I ended up selling to, to D1 Ticker, you know, it's a, I'm actually, at their headquarters right now. I live in Chicago. I'm in Kentucky. I'm in like their little studio because we were trying to take care of a little bit of last minute paperwork for that sale. But I'm always telling my 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 readers who are not in this industry, when they think about these kind of things, you have to think like a university president and not just like a coach. And that intangible prestige and the this this nebulous concept of institutional fit and like-minded peers is really important. I, I, growing up in Big Ten country and been like you know, having parents who became academics and being in that world a lot. When you are recruiting a chemistry professor to a Big Ten school, they talk about being a Big Ten institution. And it's not like the chemistry professor cares about who's going to make the NCAA women's basketball tournament or anything. But it's this way of Michigan and Ohio State and Illinois saying we are like this. And also we are like Wisconsin. 
we were like Purdue and, you know, Purdue sent a couple of people on the moon. Don't you know, like that's, you know, that's, that's a big deal. And we're like, we're like Minnesota and this, this great here tradition. And, and that gets kind of messy too, because then I to say, well, to enhance our athletic profile, we should invite Liberty. And then you have a university president and the faculty union who are losing their minds because that's the last thing that they want to do is to be able to go into a faculty union and say, and now meet like my, my new peer who I am alike in every way, Jerry Falwell Jr. Like, that, like you know, even at the conservative institutions, are like, no, 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 no. And and this this was an issue for for BYU. It's an it's an issue right now for regional public institutions. It's an issue for Boise State. This is the, the pejorative thing that I've heard a lot in, in in academic circles, which is not entirely untrue. Is this is a truck driving school? You weren't. It wasn't that long ago when you were a junior college. Now. Does that matter for how well you can run the West Coast offense? No, no, no one's checking up your Carnegie designation here on the on the, the, the people that actually make these decisions. These are kind of things that do matter, and and this is this is part of what has fueled extra points because I'm writing for both the person on the message board who wants to be the smartest guy in the room and understand how everything's happening, and I'm writing for the faculty athletic representative who's suddenly charged with oversight over this gigantic behemoth. It isn't entirely sure how to get their arms around it. And also the administrator and the athletic director and, and the professor. But I think it's important to understand this, this whole hog approach of how everybody in here fits together. It shapes your realignment decisions. It shapes your spending priorities. It shapes your scheduling, how you engage with your political actors. Um, and I, 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 you could draw it through the line. You're right. Between decisions made 1905, 1910, 1920 from some of those presidents to what an athletic department looks like today. You can you can draw a straight line from Curly Bird at Maryland, from both him being a gigantic jerk and chasing away Bear Bryant to other investments and decisions that the university made, and then the backlash to those, and that gets you an idea for what Maryland looked like in '84 and what Maryland looks like now. Like that, that's part of what makes these kind of texts, I think, important, not just for historians and academics, but I think for for reporters and for bloggers and, and for general fans too to understand. Not just what what things happened as an academic exercise, but really how they meaningfully explain what you're seeing now. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, we want to leave time for some additional questions. I see Joe has put another comment in there. Oh, okay, he's got a new research question. We love that. <laughs> All right, you're welcome. <laughs> can't I can't I can't wait can't wait to hear about it. Anyone else? Please please take this opportunity. Think of something later. I'm going to drop in my email address. I love talking about this sort of thing. Um, and if something comes up later, or you're you're on the phone right now, or you have your screen off because you're you're chasing the dog or something, feel free to drop me a line, and I'm happy to. Plus, when I'm actually at my desk, I can like, oh, here's where my primary sources are. Here's my filing cabinet and everything, and I can actually I can actually share share some of those things. Like, but my text isn't just about realignment, although that that's been part of it. It talks. Administrative and financial history of television and with the NCAA itself it talks about a couple of specific games, a couple of specific coaching hires. But I would say, even though I think we talked a lot about the state of Utah, even though it's, I've never lived there today, like in, in my book, there's a lot about Nebraska, there's a lot about Michigan and Notre Dame and South Florida, because there's a, a couple of chapters here about the University of Miami. Um, and, and also, not just how they, again, how they interface into what makes a good college football program, but what that tells us about demographic change, about institutional priorities, about who has money in this sport and where they decide to spend it and why. Um, and I think as a as a companion, these two books, these two texts together, can only really tell you a lot about the history of this sport. So Matt, as a journalist, you have a different you know timetable and constraints. Uh, and and I, I, I'm impressed with how much you're able to put out on a daily and weekly basis. Uh, the the academic kind of writing is is as you know a different sort of, of beast. It's you know it can take a long time, and maybe there are questions out there that you would love to have answered, but you just can't answer them on a daily or weekly deadline sort of way. For the for the for the students in the room who are looking for a dissertation topic or or thinking about research questions, what are some of those questions that you're like? If I had the time, I would pursue this, but I don't. And so they kind of sit in, in my, you know, interesting questions folder. Oh, that's, that's a great question. There, there are two. There are two, and I have a huge Trello board 
It's like here's here if I if, if people could just stay in their stinking conferences for 72 hours and if everybody could just be cool for five minutes so I can actually read. I have all these great issues like, like CSRI journal back issues and all these other things that other academics have sent, which God bless you, please do. I, I love talking about people's research. Uh, it is a mission of mine to be able to drag the cool stuff that you're working on and make Pete Dammel read it, make, it, make the people at ESPN read it, make an AD read it. There, there are there are two. You know, one of them since we've talked a, a fair amount here about television, and there's been some a lot of scholarship I think about the uh, the how call uh, the broadcast revenues and broadcast exposure have shaped college decision ma decision making from 1952 to 1985 and then into the 90s. I don't know as much about radio, and I know that it was important enough for schools to embrace that. I know that we have a couple of examples of schools actually like bringing. Uh, people together to like listen to a radio broadcast in person or you might have somebody get up there on the chalkboard and like diagram where the ball is or, or where the plays are moving and everything and i would like to know more about how universities uh try to to chase that revenue and exposure how they handle the cognitive dissonance between we're not running a commercial product versus yes we absolutely are running a commercial product and here's the, this ex exact radio um as as administrators and, and academics and, and some community and media members express ambivalence about letting ESPN really dictate how the sport works and, and how uh, you know, bringing in those broadcast trucks and making those changes dictates those, uh, you know, when a football team plays and, and where they play and who they play. I don't know if there's, if there's been as much about radio or that I've seen it as, as much. And so I think, you know, digging into the archives and digging into King football a little bit closer and looking at the 1920s and 1910s, where people were still definitely paying a lot of money for football. I think would be very fascinating. The other one uh, that's it's a, a, about Notre Dame that I'm, I'm really interested in is, as I kind of understand on a high level, part of why Notre Dame achieved a lot of national appeal was this was the a, a much more egalitarian institution. This was the place that would accept the policemen and the teachers' kids. This was a school that was unabashedly willing to accept uh, ethnic kids, right? And, and then it meant like if you were Polish, if you were Italian, if you were Irish, if you weren't a wasp. You could have a home at Notre Dame and you could compete athletically at a high level. And there were Knights of Columbus halls all across the country, right, that are, that are showing Notre Dame games in part to keep people out of the bars. Uh, and, and in part, because even if you were nowhere near South Bend, Indiana, you can look and feel some representation and some connection to this football program. Like I, it's, it's clearly part of, for some level, what the Catholic identity is. But Catholicism in the United States in 2022 looks really different from Catholicism in the United States during the golden age of Notre Dame football. It's the the Catholicism in this country is 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 much browner. It's much more Latino. It's it's younger. It's it's we we it's it's more even more diverse, independent of of, of Hispanic and Latino identity. Um, and Notre Dame's di uh, demographics and what Notre Dame means is different too. Plus, you can be a Catholic, as I understand it, in this country, and nobody in your parish or nobody that you know went to Notre Dame, d d depending on where you live, which is not the case. Maybe if you're an evangelical in the in the South with Liberty, it's certainly not if you're a Latter Day Saint. Uh, there's your bishop is probably a BYU grad or, or, or where you are. So I would love to do some interviews and talk to some priests or talk to some historians. And I would want to read about how has Notre Dame fandom and Notre Dame's relationship with Catholicism and that identity shifted over the last several decades? What does it look like when parochial education is not a cornerstone of America as it was several decades ago or when the, the, the we have a more secular world? And uh, yeah, I, I thought about it even because you know where I live in Chicago, northwest part of the city, in the 40s and 50s was like a you know just a big time Notre Dame neighborhood. This was a place that that sent kids to to Big Ten colleges, and now it's uh, you know the the neighborhood demographics are very different. The football team has like 35 kids and is is, is nearly shutting down. Um, the 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 parish priest I, I only know because you know the guy lives on my street. He's from the Philippines. Like the the parish looks very different from from when it did you know back back in the heyday. I would love to read about that. I would love to. I would love to talk to some experts and and learn more about how that dynamic has changed. Can I pop in for a second? Oh, please, was please. raising hand. Okay, sorry. No. 
Yeah, hey, I'm Christian. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually one of uh, Christian and Amber's colleagues in the department. So thank you for being for being with us. And it's exciting to listen to this. And I'll be honest, I am not a football person, but uh, I've learned a lot. And it's really interesting to me uh, to hear you talk and stuff. So thank you for that. But um, I think it's interesting also when you talk about um, the piece about Catholicism and Notre Dame and everything is that especially when you so some, as somebody who was raised Catholic, I went to um, a Catholic undergrad and then my master's program was also Catholic. But the Catholic institutions I went to were Jesuit. Right. So if you look at all the Jesuit institutions, we don't do football like we're like, we don't do football. We do basketball 100 percent and everything. So um, so I think um, there's definitely a lot to delve into, especially when you're trying to connect that um, that the Catholic piece, I think, with with college football and everything, because they're just most Catholic institutions. The priority really is going to be basketball nowadays. Right. And there's a large identity and a large following with that and everything. So um which I think that's also some of the pieces with why Notre Dame, you know, like if, if you're Catholic and you want to go to a Catholic school where there's a football team, Notre Dame's a place to go, but right. So that's like one of very few places, like if you're Catholic that you would go to for, um, for higher ed. So just, just making that point. No, it's, it, it is, it is a, it is a great point. And, and that's also a world where, you know, I, as somebody that wasn't part of that faith tradition, like I have, scholarship I need to catch up on. There's people I need to talk to. There's a world I need to know. I, I, it's funny. I actually, I just last week, uh, one of my readers sent me a picture. He's a fan of, of St. Thomas up in Minnesota. And his priest was, it looked like getting the Eucharist and uh, at a tailgate. And he, was, he was in his, his uh, he brought everything there and had, had done a little mass. And like that like blew my mind. Like the, the idea of anybody in my faith tradition, like performing an ordinance or giving ecclesiastical services in this informal setting like, does not compute. But you know, I, I want to interview the priest and, and write about it in the newsletter next month. Like, we got to go where the people are. Things are different. It's not nineteen. It's not nineteen fifty two anymore. And so there's there's a there's a sports component to this too, as well as a religious and a cultural and an educational one. And I'm interested in all those things. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you, Christina. Um, looks like we have time for one more question, and Judy Van Horn has her hand raised. Judy, you want to go ahead? Sure, thank you. This is fascinating. Appreciate you taking time and doing this uh, for all of us students. It's been learning a lot. So I, I, I'm curious because you talk about you know the his, historical events and their impact on present day college football, college athletics, and we've had we see a lot of changes in college athletics. Whether it's name, image, and likeness, it's the Austin case, and before that we had cost of attendance monies based on your understanding of this world, what do you see next? Or can you imagine what's next? Is the future predictive? So it's almost like a two-pronged question. What do you think will happen? And what do you think should happen, in your opinion? That's a great question. And you know, I, I've joked about this, right? Because mm -hmm. this, is, this is not an uncommon one, but if I had a really effective crystal ball, my newsletter would be much more expensive <laughs> than, it, than, <laughs> than, it, than it is right now. I think where we are seeing some of the most change is with athlete rights and activism. And this it was it was slow, 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 and suddenly very fast, very quick. And I think that that's going to continue. You can already see the National Labor Relations Board and and multiple now senators are are, are pushing for um, college athletes to be recognized as employees and as such be able to then collectively bargain and not just receive name, image, like this money, which is you know kind of the equivalent of of uh, we're not going to pay you for your real job, but you're allowed to hustle for a second job kind of thing, you know, treating everybody like a like a poorly funded you know, graduate assistant and, and to actually getting a legitimate chunk of the hundred and twelve million dollars uh, within that athletic department. What, when I talk to ADs, that is the, the thin red line that terrifies them. Um, honestly, the, the opposition to name, image, likeness, I think, was really pretty generational. You talk to an athletic director who's under 50. Um, or hadn't been in the industry for 20 years. They're like, this, this is fine. You know, I, I would talk to people at the Patriot League and like, we're so tired of having to spend meeting after meeting after meeting of people freaking about name of like this. We don't care. If somebody wants to drop $25,000 on a Colgate basketball player to cut a, you cut a commercial, like go with God. Like that's not my money, <laughs> but that, that's, that's, not, that's not our world where that might be your world if you live, if you're at Michigan State. I think that there's going to be, it's not just political and legal pressures to expand the the bargaining position for athletes, whether that's as um, employees or whether that's to give them more flexibility in transferring or to advocate for themselves more for actually getting the education that we allegedly promised them when, when they sign up to be, to be college athletes. And I think you're going to see more awareness on the athlete side. And I'll, I'll be honest with, with you, I think 
there's some activist wish casting a little bit about wanting to expedite that timeline about athletes boycotting a game or or unionizing. And to be honest, I, I don't think it's a shock that the North the unionization at Northwestern failed. And even with the NLR at the NLRV makes a decision to 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 reclassify employees, I would imagine several other unionization efforts will also fail. We saw um Leading up to this college football, the last college football season, the, the COVID year, when we had a, gr a group of athletes in just about every conference with uh, like their own like Pac-12 United or Big Ten United and everything, we're, we're not going to play unless we get X, Y, and Z, and then they all got rolled. So I think that's, you're going to see some conflicts there. Athletes becoming more aware of the power that they have and the leverage that they have, and then figuring out how to engage with it. And union bargaining and collective bargaining is, is messy. I've, I've been a part of some union drives before, some successful ones, some, some less successful ones. Um, it's not... It's not a straight line. So I, I, I think that, that those are where the battlegrounds are now in college athletics. It's not going to be a zip from point A to point B, the no progress to progress or the other way around it. It's going to be jagged and bumpy and uneven as we move to wherever it is that we're going, in, in my view. Yeah, that I, I tend to agree with you. I could go off on a, on a lot of tangent with that. So I will I will save my comments. Um, I did drop in the in the chat that uh, there's a follow up session, more uh, Q and A and discussion with Matt at 4:30 for our students who'd like to join us. We encourage you to do that. But at this point, we're 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 at the close of our hour. So just really want to thank Matt Brown for his time today and for his insights and expertise. We also very much appreciate the audience for attending and for being engaging and, and participating and asking those key questions. Uh, Matt, I think you're going to like this. So I'm going to tell you briefly about two upcoming programs that we have um, for, for the rest of our time with the exhibit. So the next one is Wednesday, December 1st from 3 to 4 p.m., another virtual Zoom meeting or session with Dr. Eddie Como, from, uh, Professor of Higher Education and Executive Director of the Center for Athletes, Rights, and Equity at the University of California, Riverside. And this session will serve as the Richard T. Greener Lecture Series as part of that series and is titled Choosing Their Battlefields, Paul Robeson and Other Black College Football Players Activism for Racial Equity. So be on the lookout for that announcement in Zoom link and we encourage all of you to rejoin us. Our last session will be Wednesday, January 12th after we return from the break. It's from three to 5 p.m. And we'll be having Dr. Richard Southall, director of CSRI or the College Sport Research Institute who's joining us. He um, is also a professor here, here at the University of South Carolina. We feel very fortunate to have CSRI on our own campus. We will be uh, watching Schooled, The Price of College Sports, the documentary um, that was pre pre shines a light on a lot of issues uh, related to college athlete rights, as well as Dr. Southall's position on that. We're very opinionated and, and we enjoy that. So this session will actually occur in the Museum of, Edu of Education in Wardlaw College. So we'll be sending out information as well, but uh, mark your calendars for Wednesday, January 12th from 3 to 5 p.m. And uh, Matt, I know you mentioned um, um, CSRI a few times, so hopefully we'll get to see you at an, an April conference here in Columbia before too long. That would be great. I hope so. I spent so much time building this newsletter in my own basement. And listen, my chair is very comfortable. All my beverages are there, but there's, there's something to be said for seeing all of your smiling faces. So I, I would love to be there in April. Excellent, awesome. Well, thank you again and thanks to everyone and hopefully we'll see many of you back here at 4 30 but if not keep thinking about these topics and until next time thank you again and again i, I did i did drop in my email address there in the in the chat by, by all means if something else comes up everyone uh feel free to drop me a line i'll be happy to help if i can <laughs>